Over 3,000 meters up in the peaks of the Hindu Kush, winter releases its grip reluctantly. Heavy snows and avalanches constantly threaten the Salang Tunnel, the lifeline between Afghanistan's north and its south. For the French NGO acted, keeping the tunnel open to traffic in winter is hard work, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In March, Afghans celebrated the traditional New Year that also marks the arrival of spring. Nowruz means new day, a time of renewal. The snow melt has created streams and dry riverbeds of the Somali Plain. This water is precious to farmers who have been struggling through years of drought. But as the Rorband River gains strength in spring, it jumps its banks. The U.S. government is funding a project to harness the Rorband's waters, prevent flooding, and channel the river to benefit close to 20,000 families. It represents part of $820 million the United States has committed this year to Afghanistan for aid in reconstruction after a quarter century of warfare and suffering. Breaking the rocky ground for dams and canals is hard work, but it also provides employment to local villagers. By summer, this new source of irrigation will be one of more than 6,000 water-related projects completed with U.S. funding. Kabul, the nation's capital, has shaken the snows of winter and is a city in a hurry to do business. Its crowded streets reflect the optimism, hope and industriousness of the Afghan people. The popular shops of Chicken Street sell Afghan arts and crafts, especially to foreign visitors, and business is picking up again. Resourceful shopkeepers rely on generators to bridge Kabul's still unreliable power supply. Each store outdoes the next with offerings of rugs, jewelry and antiques. Among the items for sale from bygone eras, old money. The central government has instituted a single currency for Afghanistan, taking the place of an assortment of regional currencies. The new Afghani is a symbol of national pride as well as economic stabilization. With the new currency in Afghanistan, our business has improved very much. Since the old money did not have much value, people weren't very interested in buying things, and they couldn't carry such a large sum of money either. Now people are very happy because the new money has value, their government salaries are paid in the new money, and they can buy anything they need. Some of the regeneration of Kabul is happening in unexpected places. Babur Gardens used to be an oasis of flowers, almond trees and swimming pools, a refuge from the noise and pace of city life. The park spills down a hillside in the west of the city and once provided a spectacular vista over a thriving Kabul all the way to the mountains. The gardens were laid out by Emperor Babur Shah, 16th century founder of the Mughal Empire and this is where he chose to be buried. There are many more practical priorities in helping Kabul back on its feet, but the Babur Gardens are part of the city's soul and people's distant memories of happier times. Now, with coalition funding, it's a symbol of hope for better days to come. Workmen are restoring the pavilion that once housed the park's cafe, carefully replicating its original features and artisanship. Abdel Wahid spent 30 years as the gatekeeper of Babur Gardens and he still comes to the park daily. <laughs> he has no explanation for why this once beautiful spot became a battleground between warlords but he believes in its restoration. He still charges admission to the rare visitor 
With tickets he has kept in his pocket since the fighting closed Babur Gardens down. Although my time is gone, my hope is that, God willing, there will be reconstruction and peace in the country for the next generation, for the young, so they will see days of peace in their lives. Security for Kabul and its environs is provided by the International Security Assistance Force, known as ISAF. In February, Germany and the Netherlands took over the rotating six-month leadership of ISAF from Turkey. NATO will be taking over the mission this fall. The coalition that comprises Operation Enduring Freedom is headquartered at Bagram Air Base. <laughs> The Alpini are soldiers of the Italian Army's Mountain Regiment. They're among the nearly 8,000 international troops contributing to ISAF or Operation Enduring Freedom. The Alpini are providing stabilization and reconstruction in Host Province along Afghanistan's border with Pakistan. The Jordanian Army has come to Afghanistan on a medical mission. It runs a state-of-the-art field hospital in the harsh climate of Balkh province in the country's north. Almost 170,000 Afghans have been treated here by an expert team of 20 Jordanian doctors who have a full range of specializations. With logistical support from the U.S., the hospital has performed well over 2,000 surgeries in its first year of operation. It provides the best and often only medical care in the region. Abdul Qayyum traveled two days by car to get here. Bismillah, injured by machine gun fire, says his arm would have been amputated in the local hospital. Here, it has been saved. In our hospital in Akcha, I realized that my arm was doing very badly. So I went to Mazar, and there it didn't improve either. So I came here, and the doctors are very good, and they worked very hard on me. Slovakia is taking part in Operation Enduring Freedom and has sent a team of expert engineers who specialize in building airfields. They maintain and improve Bagram's runways alongside American soldiers. Based on the request from CENTCOM, the Slovak government and later our parliament decided to send our unit here for Operation Enduring Freedom to participate in the common effort in the war on terrorism. There are also less formal alliances at work here, like the one between these Dutch-bred dogs and their Bosnian handlers. These teams are professionals with years of experience in removing landmines. The dogs are trained to safely locate the hidden mines and can sniff out the smallest speck of explosive buried underground. This is an important service to a place as riddled with mines as Afghanistan. But Kabul is still struggling with the rest of Afghanistan to recuperate from almost a quarter century of occupation and warfare. In the rubble of the former Russian cultural center, dating back to the days of Soviet occupation, Lenin has lost face. Kabul has become a refuge for hundreds of thousands of Afghans who fled or lost their homes in Kabul and elsewhere in the country. The numbers of desperately needy people are far greater than the government can cope with. Entire families have taken shelter in Kabul's abandoned ruins just to have a roof over their heads, but little else. They are trying to survive with no source of income, no plumbing, no electricity. Last winter, the U.S. government contributed over $2 million in emergency assistance to the neediest people in Kabul. Here, the NGO CHF provided temporary latrines, water pumps, blankets, stoves, and plastic sheeting to help these people get through the harsh winter months. But while the homeless cannot stay here indefinitely, they're reluctant to return to the villages they fled or were driven from and where they may not find assistance. Right now, we're in a little bit of a dilemma that they are here, the winter's still with us, and if, if we can get them to transfer back to the Shamali Plains or the areas where they come up north where we can rebuild their homes in these areas and they would definitely move out of here.
outside Kabul, security and stabilization in Afghanistan are still a work in progress. This is Asadabad in Konar province, a few miles from the border with Pakistan. Salam alaikum, thank you. U.S. Army General Daniel McNeil is here to meet with community leaders, one of the regular visits he makes on a weekly basis throughout Afghanistan. The meeting has no set agenda. It's an opportunity for an exchange of views and goals. The open discussion reveals mutual respect and common interests, but also differing perceptions of the situation in Konar. The local chief of security assures his guests that the province is no longer a base for remnant al-Qaeda or Taliban fighters. Tribal leader Saeed Mahbub Pacha expresses gratitude for America's role in the defeat of the Soviets and the Taliban. He hopes aid organizations will come to Konar to build roads, educational institutions and a hospital. General McNeil has some points of his own he wants to get across. Are there those amongst you who fought the Soviets when the Soviets were in Konar province? Would you show me? I will say to you that those of you who have fought the Soviets as Mujahideen, I have great respect for you. You are good warriors. But I want you to understand that there's a great difference between Soviets and Americans. We're not here to occupy your country. McNeil draws a connection between security and the arrival of aid organizations, and he asks the community's assistance. I am counting on you to help us. This is the leadership of Konar. This group knows everything that goes on in this province. We do not want any more shooting at our forces. We do not want any more mines in the road. You can stop it. This is General McNeil's second meeting with the Konar leaders, and in the Afghan tradition of hospitality, the exchange of views continues during a luncheon in the general's honor. The governor of Konar province says he understands the American security concerns. He welcomes the opportunity for Afghans to meet face to face with Americans. I'm very satisfied with the meeting. The problems that our people have, the Americans will gradually solve them. A time will come that they will themselves come and tell us that the problems are solved. The Americans get an enthusiastic welcome from children whose school soldiers helped villagers restore. As on all these trips, the visitors are bringing school supplies donated by American children. The boys use the opportunity to show off their writing skills. The soldiers based in Asadabad are also providing medical care by opening their base clinic to the public. Every week, hundreds of people seek help with conditions ranging from parasitic infections to severe injuries. Nasser's two-year-old son, Sahibullah, was badly burned when a pot of boiling water spilled. This clinic means a lot to us poor people. We are very happy about it, so that we don't have to travel to Bajawar or Peshawar. We are being treated right here, and we are very happy about it. This is a follow-up visit for Sahibullah to get his bandages changed. The doctors often deal with injuries from unexploded ordnance. They can perform some surgeries and stabilize more critically injured patients for treatment at the American hospital in Bagram. While this is an army field clinic, very few of its patients are American soldiers. Gardez is the capital of the southern province of Paktia, bordering Pakistan. The city was chosen as the first of eight sites nationwide for provincial reconstruction teams. These PRTs provide a safe environment for reconstruction activities in areas where conflict has hindered aid efforts. Alongside American troops, soldiers of the new Afghan National Army are working to stabilize the Gardez area. It is this army, expected to be 70,000 strong when training is completed, that will be responsible for the country's safety. The soldiers are a new experience for the people of Gardez, who say they neither look nor behave like local militias. The army hasn't harmed anybody and people have a good impression. All ethnic groups of Afghanistan are in the army. They are like brothers and we are sure that God willing Afghanistan will be rebuilt. Governor Dalili of Paktia province recognizes an important role for the nation's new army. The whole nation is happy about the formation of a national army. 
the decision to build one has been taken by Hamid Karzai personally and the members of the cabinet. Americans are just helping. ISAF is helping. And without this, there is no means of bringing about security. When the Taliban were in control of Gardez, they shut down the Nazwan Girls School. It reopened last year and is one of almost 20 schools that are part of the Gardez PRT. Local people are hired to do the construction work. Throughout Afghanistan, U.S. funding has opened the doors to more than 100 schools. 1,000 more will be restored or newly built over the next three years. Halima Hazan is principal of the school that was founded by her father, Mohammed. When families were fearful of sending their daughters back to school after the fall of the Taliban, she went house to house in Gardez, convincing people to let the girls get an education. There are still people who don't want girls to go to school, but in Halima school alone, there are over 1,000 girls who have made another choice. Before, our school was in ruins, blown to pieces, and now it has been painted and rebuilt, complete with doors and windows. For little girls who have never been to school, this is a welcome novelty. For older girls whose education stopped at age eight under the Taliban, this is an opportunity of which they had only dreamed. While the PRT has set it off to a strong start, their school faces a long-term financial struggle. There is a lot of significance of an education. It's useful. If a mother knows how to read or an older sister does, they will be able to help the others. Society progresses this way. It's a good thing. It's very beneficial for females. This is the Gardez Civil Hospital. The PRT has provided restoration work, four new wards, and a generator. The hospital treats men as well as women and children. An EKG and this ultrasound machine donated through the PRT are important new tools in providing better patient care. Dr. Nazdana Paktiawala is the assistant director of the hospital. Compared to four years ago when we had nothing, right now about 22 services are active in operation, including the maternity branch. We are staffed and provide services to the people 24 hours a day. In Afghanistan's north, Hajis returning to Mazari Sharif in spring were welcomed with celebrations. This year showed great improvement in the travel arrangements to Saudi Arabia for the Hajj. According to the Afghan government, over 25,000 Afghans throughout the country were able to travel to Mecca directly from regional airports. This was twice the average number and a national record. The pilgrims say their journey was easier and better organized. This sentiment is echoed at the revered Blue Mosque of Mazari Sharif, shrine to Hazrat Ali. The mosque, built in honor of the Prophet Muhammad's son-in-law, has a turbulent history dating back to the 12th century. In 1998, the bloody takeover of Mazar by the Taliban cost thousands of civilian lives. But people claim that the sacred mosque survived that and more fighting without so much as a bullet hole. The mosque's Imam Maulavi Abdul Hanan says that in his district alone, 4,000 people made the pilgrimage to Mecca this year. Our hearties were very happy, and the other good thing is that we have good memories this year of the services provided by our government. People could fly from their own region, and the Hajj program was also well prepared ahead of time, so pilgrims arrived a month before the ceremonies. It is said that all doves landing on the grounds of the Blue Mosque turn pure white, and that it is very good luck to have them land on you. The people of Mazari Sharif are hoping for some good fortune to come their way. Mazar is surrounded by one of Afghanistan's most fertile regions, about 100 kilometers south of the border with Uzbekistan. The city is Afghanistan's fourth largest and has always been a major trading center, long famed for its carpets, silk and cotton. The streets are lined with stores and vendors, but it is still hard to make a living. Many people say the city needs greater stability and security before the economy can gain strength. 
At his third meeting in Mazari Sharif, General McNeil brings his message to rival regional leaders Mohammed Atta and Abdul Rashid Dostum. It is one of support for President Karzai's government and for a lessening of tensions in the region. General McNeil has facilitated contacts between the two men who have begun to disarm their local militias. The Karzai government named Dostum regional representative to the central government in Kabul. The desire for peace and stability is strong on the streets of Mazari Sharif. I hope for peace to come, weapons to be collected, and that brothers stop killing brother in Afghanistan. We want peace and security for the weapons to be collected. Local people want the opportunity to select their own government. Whomever they choose should govern and peace should prevail. We want nothing more than good government, security, a good economy and good education. That's all we want. Bamiyan bears witness to a civilization dating back to antiquity but few traces of modern times. The former kingdom was a key station along the Silk Road linking China to the Western world. In the 3rd century BC, it carried not just trade, but Buddhism to the region. Giant Buddhas carved into the mountains of the Hindu Kush attracted visitors from all over the world, bringing jobs and income to this isolated region. Two years ago, the fundamentalist Taliban destroyed the 1,500-year-old statues as sacrilegious. The Taliban brutally persecuted the Shiite Hazaras of Bamiyan, labeling them heretics. Hundreds of men, sometimes women and children, were taken from their families and executed. With the fall of the Taliban, nearly 1.8 million Afghans returned home last year from refugee camps in Pakistan and Iran, a million more than expected. An additional million people were internally displaced in decades of warfare. Like many other returnees to Bamiyan, this family of ten sought shelter in one of the ancient caves. They have been here for seven months with few prospects of better housing or work. Bamiyan is peaceful, but most of its people need assistance to survive. Small things can make a big difference. This new well provides potable water to villagers who are drinking stream water and using it for food preparation. Diseases born by unclean water take a high health toll in Afghanistan. In this village, a water pump has already improved lives. <laughs> the main benefit for us is that the water is clean. It doesn't have any microbes. Since this well has been dug, there is very little illness in our village. As throughout Afghanistan, most of Bamiyan's people live off agriculture, and they need help in making the spring snow melts go a long way. Afghans make every effort to squeeze water from stones, and engineering assistance almost makes that possible. With funding from the U.S., the aid organization CHF has constructed aqueducts in Bamiyan to give spring waters a wider reach to benefit more farmers and their families. This is small physically, but it's very large in terms of what it's going to do with the community. This is going to feed water into dry fields. Afghanistan has suffered not only war, Afghanistan has suffered drought for the last five years. And when we've asked people what they have needed, as often as not, they've said water. We cannot bring rain, but we can bring irrigation to their fields. When the Taliban were rampaging through Bamiyan, they also destroyed sheep herds, animals that people rely on for wool, fertilizer, milk and meat. CHF is working on replenishing these herds and paying particular attention to the needs of widows. So far, sheep have been distributed to almost 1,800 of the neediest families here. Each family gets one animal, widows are given two. 48-year-old Azra's husband was killed by the Taliban, leaving her to care for five children. She says she couldn't do it without the donated sheep. Animal specialist Shafak traveled for months to buy animals of the most suitable breed. The animals must be able to adapt to our environment. This is a Turkish breed that adapts well to our weather. 
توافق داره و اکثریت چون این مردم در کوها The people here even take them to the mountains in the winter. That's why we selected the strong Turkish breed for distribution in our community. To assist people with winterizing and improving their shelter, doors, window frames and beams for roof construction were distributed to the most needy. Aid and reconstruction efforts in Bamiyan have included the market at Shahidan. In 1998, it was destroyed in warfare when the Taliban took over. The shops serve villagers in three remote valleys of the province. Customers come as far away as 80 kilometers to buy food staples and basic household goods. The market in Bamiyan village is also coming back to life. What's for sale here goes beyond the necessities, and little restaurants show an optimism that more visitors might be returning to Bamiyan. There is no lack of industriousness or appreciation for the changes that have come so far. The job situation in Bamiyan, thank God, is good. The job situation in all of Afghanistan is very good since the Taliban left. Saidi brings merchandise from Kabul to sell in Bamiyan, and that's a rough journey. Because the roads are in bad condition, things transported from Kabul or outside the country often arrive damaged. Work has begun on the 2,400 kilometers of badly damaged ring roads that once connected Afghanistan's largest cities. Almost 50 kilometers have been demined, graded and leveled, and asphalting is about to begin. It will be a large undertaking to revive this vital part of Afghanistan's infrastructure, and the US, Japan and Saudi Arabia have made a start with a commitment of $180 million. The United States has made the completion of the ring road a top priority. It's a new year and spring has returned to Afghanistan. The country and its allies are at work on the future.